welcome to episode one of a new venture or something. It's not like I don't do this in other forms, but this is a podcast about the wonderful art of collecting movies or watching films and kind of special features and all the things that go with it. And from maybe a UK slant, even though both myself and my good friend here are known to dip our hands into foreign foreign territories and foreign waters. Um, before I really get into that, I'll introduce the man who is here to keep me company and make sure I don't see anything um, that could be litigious or yes. too controversial. I mean, not much of a job to say, but you can introduce Absolutely. yourself. Um, I'm Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films, and as always, it's a pleasure to join you and an honour um, <laughs> for episode one of oh, what dear. we all hope will be a long-standing um, series. Hopefully we'll be okay. here, episode five, I'm just... <laughs> you know, given my history of starting series and never finishing them, let's just say this could be an interesting couple of weeks. <laughs> well, tell me about it. I think I had announced the series exactly one year ago when I still haven't started it on the channel. So. What, you know, it's still plans, for still sure. Planned. It's still yeah. planned, absolutely. Have, have you got all the, the discs bought and ready to be watched? Yes, absolutely. See? It's like, it's near... It's nearly like the, the whole series is done. Yes, in my mind it's done, just not and, in reality. And who knew Joseph Losey had that many films? Yeah, I've only got one left. One only got one left. Know. And then I'll have so, to come up with some kind of summation. So, my name is Chris Mullen. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about movies and books. Ronan obviously has a grand, much more grandiose uh, YouTube channel. Than, the, the, than, than, so. than my own. I think this is a kind of running joke that we keep on having with each other, is that now we've hit the big time. And yes. I had a hundred views on my my video, therefore I have I have made it retire now. So the idea of the show is we're going to use the old adage about getting married, which kind of ironically, you know, with my co who's been solitary running. Yes. Could have been a bit cruel. I don't I, I don't know whether yeah, the that's idea. Not- that, Gonna happen, yeah. Not gonna happen exactly right. So we're gonna do this something old, something new, something borrowed, and then this being something blue. So something old being what we are currently watching, what current rabbit holes are we as movie lovers, movie watchers kind of fallen down? And if we're gonna record this every two weeks, two weeks is about my cycle for the rabbit hole that I'm currently on before yeah. it kind of moves to another level, another part of the world, something like that. Uh, then talk about something new, which can be news, can be upcoming releases for the next couple of weeks, what we're thinking about picking up, what things are exciting or what things are being talked about. And then the something borrowed will be, well, a suggestion will be made as to a film that you would like to discuss. So if anybody's listening along going, I'd love to discuss this movie because it's one of my favourites and nobody ever talks about it, that would be your opportunity to come on the show and, uh, and talk about that one. And what one did you did you bring? Um, I bought Dennis Villeneuve's Encendie. Um This is the lovely Plain Archive edition. Oh, that um, is pretty. And this is Villeneuve's last um, French language film mm. um, before he went to Hollywood. Um, I think he is the best Hollywood mainstream director. Um, obviously, he does have his knockers for going to Hollywood, but mm-hmm. um, I think On Sunday is his best film that I've seen. Obviously, he's a couple of early, his first early ones, including Maelstrom, still haven't got a release. Hopefully, yep. somebody will release that. Um, but On Sunday absolutely blew me away the first time I saw it. That's cool. So we'll look forward to getting to talk about that. And again, if you haven't seen On Sunday, at a certain point of the podcast, you might go, I'll park that and uh, come back to it another time. But suffice to say, if you're unsure at this stage and you're thinking, should I watch it on Sunday? The answer is unequivocally yes. yes. 100%. So, rabbit holes at the moment, past couple of weeks. Anybody that's been following your, your YouTube channel <laughs> will know exactly where this yeah. conversation's going. But if you haven't, um, yes, what have you haven't. got? Well, some rabbit holes are deeper than others. You get <laughs> so far into it and then, you know, availability becomes an issue cost sometimes gets prohibitive if you find yourself ordering things from Greece at £60. <laughs> um, but I've kind of been in a Czech fairy tale kind of mood or a Czech pohodke 
or fantasy film, um, and certainly three films by the same director, um, Vaclav Vorlicek, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Oh, um, but probably nearly kneeling as well. Yeah, but three wishes for Cinderella on second run, which is That's a second absolutely run DVD marvelous. though, isn't it? Isn't it's second run DVD, DVD it really is. should have well, a Blu-ray. They seem to be doing a good job as soon as the prints come available of actually re yeah. releasing them on Blu-ray, which is great. Absolutely. Um, and these wonderful collector's <laughs> edition, which are excellent <laughs> for space, um, these very strange check, um, literally a disc in a, a bit of paper, basically. <laughs> um, Who Wants to Kill Jesse, which is a wonderful, playful part comic book come to life. I mean, the speech bubbles um, that form wonderful gags. Mm. Um, and then last night, I did a review of Girl and a Broomstick, which again is absolutely fantastic with a wonderful theme song. Um, so I think one of the reasons why these films and so many of them were made that they got past the censors mm. in Czechoslovakia because if there were fairy tales and there were um, fantasy stories even if they had subtext, the censors never really noticed subtext and they generally let them go uncut, whereas obviously if you made a film that was kind of neorealist or something or yes, about what yeah. was going on, you're going to get put in prison or you know your film's going to be destroyed. Um, so that's kind of why there was so many of these fantasy or fairy tale films made in that area of the world at that time and they're just so wonderful. That's interesting because... I think that still exists today. If you have like sci-fi fantasy kind yeah. of thing, people have a tendency to pigeonhole it and not take it as serious to take your content. Uh, and yeah. you get away with a lot of uh, of subtext in those films that you wouldn't. If you think of something like, it's sort of slightly fantastical, like Party and the Guests was banned for many, yeah. many years in Czechoslovakia, but it was kind of a bit more obviously political critique than, yeah. than maybe some of the films that you're talking about there. I mean, I suppose it's the same as the Hayes Code. You know, there was ways mm. after the Hayes Code came in of using entendre and kind of hiding kind of sexualized dialogue as something else. And most of the censors just didn't notice or it mm -hmm. got to the stage there was so many films to look at that they just weren't paying attention that much. So you could pass up, you could slide a lot of things into the dialogue and stuff. Nice, yeah. And obviously, you know, the labels you're talking about there, where did you get the uh, the lovely high quality cardboard sleeves? Yes, the, the special edition <laughs> cardboard sleeves were off eBay. Um, oh, right, okay. Either from Czechoslovakia or Greece, bizarrely. They weren't actually that expensive. They were only like £11 or something. Like oh, that. my God. Um, they weren't hugely expensive. And you, you know, can definitely see where the money was spent. So. <laughs> Brexit be damned is between get yeah, a man between that's... getting in the way of his of his yeah. movie rabbit holes and uh, and new content, so to speak. Yeah, so I think they're well certainly kind of fairy tale stuff's called pohodki, I think. Okay. And that's the term for them. Um and there is an absolute bunch of them, but again, availability is kind of a problem. Um, but they are just they will put a smile on your face. Yeah, and they're all are they all late sixties? Although some of them seem to be a bit later, I think. Looking from the uh... yeah, the girl on a broomstick's seventy two. Yeah, um, but the other ones are the sixties. So. Yeah, interesting indeed. Yeah, and obviously the other um, rabbit hole, which I have found, fortunately or unfortunately, um, is one of Vinegar Syndrome's sister labels, um, Deaf Crocodile which I've so far watched three of them and they're all absolutely wonderful, including um, The Tale of Zara Salton, which is just the most beautiful fairy tale um, you'll ever see. Fairy tale done properly. Yeah. Um, you genuinely don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and it's just absolutely beautiful. We were uh, we were talking just before we started recording there about slipcovers, and obviously vinegar yes. syndrome has perpetuated this kind of new market. I think when when they came along for for even more desirable slipcovers, and I think the contrast in those tef crocodile ones between the non slipcover and the slipcover, the art in them, is so striking. So it, it'll make yeah. a slipcover fan of you. Yeah, I mean, 
again, I've never really been that bothered with slipcovers, but for some reason the Death Crocodile ones have caught my eye. So that's the standard cover. Yeah. Which if you're watching absolutely the video, yeah. fine. And and the inside you do get that's uh, right not on just the reverse. A bushlet, but you do actually just get so what's on um, the slip cover, but there's something wonderfully sturdy about these slip covers. Um and the colour is just um remarkable. So as I said, I've only watched three so far. I watched um, Malcolm McDowell, The Assassin of the Tsar. Which I have um, here somewhere. Yeah, it's over there. Which is yeah. quite wonderful as well. Um but I have yet to watch Zero Grad, which is by the same director as the Assassin of the Assassin of the Tsar and the Unknown Man of Shandigar. And some Iranian time travel films, which is the box set, um, which I managed to get on Vinegar Syndrome's sale, so they were almost half price. Bargains. It's almost like they were given <laughs> away. Yeah, and they are numbered, <laughs> which is always bad, but yeah. they don't have a huge number quantity, in the catalogue. Yeah. I think which it's 2000. Is is the, 2000 seems to be their sort of printing quantity, something like that. Probably. Yeah, and as far as, you know, they only have, I think, maybe 13 or 14 releases, even though they do seem to be picking up now. Yeah. Um, but, again, Vinegar Syndrome's kind of subject matter doesn't really interest me that much, but Death Crocodile is just that kind of sweet spot with Russian and East Czech European, and just, yeah. yeah, just that. Plus, it's almost you know, kind of second runnish, but... Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, then yeah. those ones like Prague Nights you talked about actually uh, yeah. a little while ago as well, the short story anthology kind of uh, uh, film that's wonderful as well. As well. But it's not the it's not the only uh, vinegar syndrome label that you find yourself drawn to this year either. You know, you've got the catalog as well, which yes, <laughs> I've got a bunch of them. Yes, and there's only one that I really didn't like, which was KFC. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of KFC. Those. That's all right. Um, have you actually watched Amigo? I still haven't picked Amigo. I have, I have, I've, I've got Amigo here, but I haven't watched them. I'm, I'm looking at the yeah. top of my shelf here. It's because this yes. the my vinegar syndrome part of stuff is in a different room from the rest. Of my, I, I sometimes forget about it when you when you're yeah. you're doing that browse to what should I pick to what to watch next, and I'm like oh, I forget about that sometimes. But yes, Amigo is there. All you need is like one more partner label, and you'll be caught in this kind of thing of what yeah. do you do. They do have quite a lot of partner labels. I've noticed they certainly do, on their site. Do. They've got a bunch. So. Canadian International Pictures would be the other one that I regularly yellow veil. They're the other two that kind of I sometimes find myself drawn towards. But anyway, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't want to cost you any more heartache and pain no. and, uh, no. and poor tax dodging. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> VAT dodging, whatever, whatever that is at the time. And of I course, talk- the... Sorry, I was just going to say the other thing that I'm still doing is trying to get as many um, Jan Maria Volante films as I can, because um, I have I now have a rule of see Volante by Volante. So, yeah, I mean it's a pretty um, good life rule. And obviously, did I am afraid, which is mm-hmm. um, with Damiano Damiani, which I'm sure we'll mention in a second. Quite soon. Yep. Um, and Operation Ogro, which is about the last days of Franco. Um, and the terrorist group from the Basque um, mm-hmm. who decide to initially kidnap his successor and then it turns to execute his successor. So you can tell Volante, if you look at his career, he's not really in a lot of fluff. Yes, He's not yeah. really in a lot of kind of knockabout comedies or anything like that. Um, he always chose films that kind of had... A, polit- a political slant as he did um, a question a question for you to ponder actually and not, not looking at an immediate answer in this or anything think of how many actors that you think were better or fav- more favourite in your eye apart from George e. Scott of course um, yes. than not big fan. Maria Volante you know he's a, a pretty well, Christopher Walken record. will always have a oh, there you go walking one um, but again it's another beautiful thing about being in this YouTube community, because again, mm. I always had the preconception of Volante as that crazy guy from the Dollar films. <laughs> yes, dude. And if it wasn't for this channel, perhaps, and being in the community and getting recommendations, mm-hmm. I would have perhaps never seen the other side of Volante, which is much broader and wider than just playing a crazy guy in a couple of westerns. 
Yeah, for sure. And I suppose it links on quite nicely to my rabbit hole over the past couple of weeks, uh, which is, you know, I've got a stream coming up this Sunday on Radiant's Films, and they kind of started theirs, and I thought to myself, oh my God, a lot of these have been arriving in through the door, and I haven't watched all of them. And while everybody else has been assuring me that they haven't watched them all either, there's an OCD part of my brain that goes, I know, but, yes. but, especially when somebody says, oh, but this film's very good, like you'd popped into your... Or uh, one of our chats the other day and said, Oh, do you know what's really good? The Iron Prefect's really good. With Gialano Gemma as yes. the Mori, who was the prefect who came and sorted out Sicily, so to speak, and kind of shut down the mafia, being his kind of no nonsense yeah. style. Now, I sort of didn't want to read anything about it when you'd said it's very good, and I kind of picked it up and says, Well, Roland thinks it's very good, you know. It could mean any one of a number of things. Yes. You know, it could, could be interesting but weird. Could be, you know, all of those things. And of course, I put it on the run times basically two hours. And I went, oh god, but that's two hours. It's it's half an hour too yes. long for somebody that watches a lot of movies. But it is absolutely terrific. Uh, it sort yes. of reminds me a lot of, and it's not even the same type of film. But the the politics etc. of it is one of our um, our other favorite films, uh, starring. Jean Maria Volante, uh, which is God, what's the name of it? Investigation of Citizen Love Suspicion. No, not that one. The one where he's exiled in. Uh, oh, Christ stopped it, I believe. Christ, Christ stopped it, I believe. Absolutely, absolutely, disappeared from my head. It has sort of a feel yeah. of the politics of that, if you know what I mean. And then that, and that Christ stopped it, I believe, is just him being exiled from the political mess that that was Italy at the time, and in this case we have this individual that again there's a bigger political mess in Italy but he's here to sort out yeah. that corner corner of the globe and ultimately how that plays out how successfully he is how he gets to do it for me it was the first time I'd seen Gemma in something that where he was very serious he's very different in this role compared to the other things that I've seen him in like yeah. Day of Anger etc well um, the director um, Squitteri is mm-hmm. it um, he wanted Burt Lancaster. That's right. Um, but Burt Lancaster was ill, and he said, "Get me anybody apart from Juliana Gemma, <laughs> because of his reputation as being blonde and gorgeous and smiling all the time." That's right. And it is a completely different. It is one of those examples. I don't know whether there's a video in it of actors that are so kind of famous for one thing, but then they do something else and they do it brilliantly. Um, suppose. Maybe like Robin Williams and um, the one play he played the guy who worked in the photo. Yeah, and um, s- I was going to send. No, it's not. Focus, no, it's, no. Not, it's not. I was going to send Somnia, but it's not Somnia either. Oh. Uh, oh, I can't remember. I know the one. I know exa- a one hour photo. One hour photo. Yeah, one hour photo, photo is exactly right. But, but um, then that led to some more roles for Robin Williams and that. And I'd say yeah. a lot of the people that you would discuss in that are comic actors turned serious. Like Jack Lemmon would be another yeah. very good example, although he did a yeah. lot of dramatic roles in the end, uh, and some like incredibly successful. Yeah. yeah, Gemma is a revelation, to be honest. And that. <laughs> He's very serious. He's not actually 100% likeable. You know, he's so focused that he doesn't necessarily treat the people around him very well. You know, his assistant, he kind of runs roughshod over at times. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is a guy that's just super focused. And I know um, Radiance, actually, the Facebook group did put a link up to a YouTube video that kind of oh, actually right. tells you very about good. the real guy. Um because as Alex oh, Cox, because there's a bit on the Radiance, and then we're not paid by Radiance, but a wonderful release by Radiance, and Alex Cox talks yeah. about it. Um, and the fact that the film, yes, he's working for the fascist government, but it kind mm-hmm. of makes him look as though he's not that into it, whereas in reality he was actually fairly into it. Um, but not that that changes anything. Um, well, that, that was one of the things that was kind of possible, because that's one of the things that's thrown at the film, I think, is that you know, his politics aren't really explored. But um, one of the things yeah. is, you know, I don't know if he was he was a fascist or he was just he was he respected law, and the law at that yeah. time was that fascist was rule, and that that's that that's what he did. But he he was very strong in his views. But I think it's a really it's a really impactful film. I think especially because you have this really strong central performance, and then you have I mean Claudio Cardinals in it. You know, as yeah, it's an interesting role because also this is yeah. nineteen seventy six, so. 
perhaps a little bit past her you know glory years if you will that's probably not fair but so she's not actually in it that much but she does kind of play an important role and she does maybe only have what, five or six scenes so it's not mm-hmm. like a huge part role, yeah but she does give a really determined and gritty performance it's, it's, it's quite funny as a friend of mine would say but based on your last conversation imagine what she would have said about you um <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> which leads me on nicely to your watch day there last night, which uh, I didn't actually yes. appreciate how famed this this film was in some ways, but this is again one of those like all timers. I think it's the Godfather yeah. before the Godfather was ever made. I wasn't expecting yeah. it to be quite as threatened and serious, the kind of respectful nature that that kind of went against I think a lot of other films that were doing that kind of thing around that time, you know, the pre Godfather films that kind of didn't have a respect yeah. or a reverence about them. But uh, obviously, Frank and Aaron Cardinal and DJ Cobb as well. Who, yeah, my God, that film's good. Yeah, because again, it's it's complicated, um, and again, it's realistic, and you do obviously understand the power that these guys had. Um, yeah. And back to the Iron Prefect, which shows kind of the effect on women, because mm. if they are they're kind of used to having the good life. And then when Gemma and his wife, you know, the scene where his wife gets attacked by the wives of the guys he's put in prison, right. um, which you don't necessarily see as much. And you also see the part, the media and the growing kind of media circus. And at one point, the, the writers and the photographers are actually <laughs> moving bodies about to get better that's pictures right, and that's stuff. Right, that's right. So that's a nice aspect to it as well. Um, yeah. But Day of the Owl, or simply Mafia, on the yes, ultimate right. artwork, um, it just has a wonderful sense of time and place, and it takes its time. And I mean, as all three in this wonderful set, Cosa Nostra, that only really can rival, I think, Mexico Macabre for the box set of the year. I think mm-hmm. um, big, big words. Yes, all those, all three of those films are just immaculate. Yeah. Wonderful. I have the other two two to get through, obviously, but uh, a very strong start. And I, I love actually, and anything that has like real interviews with the real stars, like having a proper interview with Franco Nero one on one feels a bit yeah. special. And even he was saying that for all the work that he's done, obviously it's Django and all the rest, and to be sort of the poster boy for what the Carabinieri are, you know, yeah. uh, because yeah. of his representation in this was even so many years later is, is just wonderful. So. Yeah, and he just has he is one of those treasures because his interviews he's just got so many great anecdotes yeah uh, mm-hmm. other ones that I watched I'll, I'll not spend as long as this Sunday Woman uh, yeah that's an that's an interesting one yeah it's Comancini again has this kind of mix of Jacqueline Bisset and uh, jean de Trantignon um, interesting to watch I've sort of forgotten an awful lot about it already because it's I think there's a lot of interesting yes. scenes in it, but it sort of seems like a lot of ideas kind of stuck together. Uh, yeah, it doesn't quite gel the way you would like it to. Yeah, um, indeed. But it's still entertaining, especially yeah. murder weapons, quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like a rolling joke yes. uh, throughout, throughout the whole yeah. thing. Uh, next up was The Hotspot with Don Johnson, uh, which yep. served to remind me just how goddamn beautiful Jennifer Connelly is. Oh, my God. Anyway, yes, um, she went from labyrinth to, to, to indeed that I kind of thing. Enjoyed this quite a lot, though. I have to say, it's, if you had asked me about it beforehand, I would have said Don Johnson was miscast, but actually, he is not. He actually does a oh. pretty great job in in holding this together, being a, a physical menace and being aloof and interesting enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it stands up probably better now than it did at the time it was released. I think, I think it, probably, it was yeah. a. T- a bit of a bomb when it was released, but it actually yeah. stands up pretty well. Yeah. And again, Don Johnson doesn't play the nicest character, but he is, um, you know, you want to find out what he's up to and what he's happens. Actually, what type of person he is, like, at the heart of it, like, he's yeah. a bit, uh, lots of twists and turns, and just, I think, one of the, a great, like, ensemble cast of character actors. You know, a lot of people that you've seen yeah. in loads of other things, you're like, oh, I recognise him, I recognise him, etc. All the rest of it. And the last Charles one, Martin Smith. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And the last one I'm going to talk about is a film that I don't think many people seem to like. And I did the first 20 minutes and went, oh, I don't, 
I don't like this, Chris. This, this isn't good. This is Rudolph Tomei's Red Sun or Rata Sun. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> I think it's really good. And it's yeah, actually, I just it, thought it was fantastic. It's actually the... It's a subject matter that I nearly always hate, in, which is nihilism. Just nihilism represented on the screen, I think, is never yeah. done well. I think if this was released today and it was a comic book movie about those four women, it would be an absolute sensational smash. But because it yeah. has this kind of German aesthetic to it, oh my god I, I have to say see two of the extras on this disc are two of the greatest extras all year they have the whole thing about the, yeah. the reformation of german cinema and then the breakdown of uh of tommy and all that like that's just what a disc what a film i thought it was yeah i mean fabulous it's perhaps it's not perfect it's no. a little bit rough around the edges but it's kind of endearing for that and i just absolutely loved it um Again, I don't know, because I have seen like one star reviews for it and stuff like yeah. that, and it's like, I'm not sure what film people are watching, but well, I, I sort of the beauty of cinema, I guess. But. I, I think, that, like I said, for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, because it's so tonally kind of cold, you know, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't make an effort for you to get to like any other people, or it just kind of represents the story as it is. I think there is a danger that you mightn't connect with any of it, but I think at a certain point, you kind of go along and actually see what's happening in the story, and yeah. you kind of see kind of how darkly humoristic and stuff it is you know yeah. I think, oh I, th I thought it was i thought it was really good when i was filling up with super just completely life and fold so yeah I that's mean, only radiance that i just haven't got into so. i'm sort of right down the middle and fill up so yeah. there's elements of it that i really like and then there's elements of that i go i don't like any of the people but then do i like any of the people yeah. on that well i suppose there is a difference Fill up a super, yes, but you're, super. you're entranced by the people in Red Sun. In Red Sun, there is a, you know, the four as a heterosexual male, I suppose I can I can absolutely see see the difference between between yeah. this and, the, and how it was done. Um, so that's it. And the only have other you one. Seen, sorry, have you seen Man in the Roof? I have seen Man in the Roof. Bo Viderberg. Yes, I thought it was really that's good as well. Special as well. Yeah, I I, I think. I, I think Man on the Roof is one of those films that you could recommend to anybody. I've seen any amount of films and I think they'll enjoy it. You know what I mean? I think Red Sun yeah. is much more difficult to recommend to you. But like the video that I did recently on the channel about six things to watch, yeah. you know, for people that are making their entry across, I think Man on the Roof would be a pretty decent example of something you could yeah. recommend. Red Sun falls into the, the thing that Peter did you know, today. With Man on the Roof, you could um, perhaps some people might be frustrated by the ending, but I just oh yeah, for sure, perfect. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, it's a great, it's a great watch. Uh, and the only other one I'll talk about is a film that I hadn't seen before. But you know, four K releases have a tendency to bring round films that you probably should have seen beforehand and not. Yeah. Last Emperor, Bernardo Bertolucci. I still haven't seen it. But see, this is the thing. You'll be Never delighted. you will be delighted to know the four K cut of this is only two hours fifty, right? But if you want to put on the Blu-ray, it's three hours fifty. Blimey! No, I, I didn't do the three hours fifty, and I have to say, for parts of this, I was like, "This is torturous." And then, as usual with those very long films, about an hour yeah. in, you go, "Oh, I'm sort of fascinated." I'm sort of like very into the characters. It's obviously, you know, this is the type of film that, that probably started this trend of being Oscar bait. You know, you take a massive epic story, yeah. you're making a massive long run time, you put a, you know, it has all the hallmarks of winning Oscars in it. Yeah. And But I still think it sort of stands alone because it only really has in a major, Peter O'Toole. Yeah. That's pretty much And it. then, I, I, some, you know, beautiful thing. It's a really good movie. Oh, damn, it's a really good movie. And again, a bit like the ones we've been talking about there, the endings and the stories that it's got to tell aren't maybe exactly where you think the story's going, but yeah. I think they're much more interesting for actually the resolution that, that happens yeah. around that time. So that's been most of my watching for the past couple of weeks. And just like you were saying about Death Crocodile and I'm talking about Radiance, I think what all those films have in common is that they're just like kind of fascinating in their own little way of things yeah, that you haven't seen before. You know? We've been long enough in the game you know, so we can appreciate a film that perhaps isn't perfect or is rough around the edges, but it's interesting, it's unpredictable. You know, the story behind it might be fascinating, yep. and that's why we love extras, and certainly Radiance and Death Crocodile seem to do a really good job with extras. 
um, rather than you know films that are absolutely perfect but perhaps not that interesting really formulaic so. I suppose it did, it did kind of spring to mind when I was like, oh, I'd like to watch all the Radiance films, you know, be caught up for, the, for that stream that people, oh, you're off, you could do like three or four in a day. And I went, but it's not a two hour movie. It's a two hour yeah. movie and then maybe a couple of hours of extras because I still want to enjoy these releases. I still want to actually get yeah. the value in the story. Like sometimes I watch a movie and think, mm, I don't know, put it in context and all of a sudden it's like transformed for me, you know, and, and it's like, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it robbed myself of that in some ways. Yeah, you don't want to rush things. Yeah, indeed. So that's what I've been too. watching. There you go. We've only been going for three and a half hours um, so far. That's fine. And, uh, Could have watched you know. The Last Emperor on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty true. Well, still had 15 minutes left to go, probably, before you get to the credits. I, will, yeah. I wonder will I ever watch that longer cut one day. And only Blu-ray? Like, could I bring myself yeah, to sink to such could you go back? Yeah. I have to say, between me and you, 4K is really nice and all, but after ten minutes I forget. And it's not—it's not like yeah. it's not like Blu-ray is just oh my god, it's a monstrosity. What what is yeah. this garbage? Um, you know, it's still a very good quality. Yeah, I think the thing. jump from DVD to Blu-ray is yeah. far greater than Blu-ray to um, 4K. It's somewhat harder. I will to say go some back. of some of these Czech uh, collectors editions, um, the DVD <laughs> prints are absolutely fine. So. I have, to, I have a couple of um, old, especially, I noticed a lot on the BFI box sets note they would do of like pre-war documentaries and those kind of films. Yeah. They're DVD only, and you would never know. Honestly, but in that kind of black and white, because the good yeah. DVD prints pop the off the screen. second run DVDs, second run DVD prints are always yeah. really good as well. Good, yeah. So, amazing, amazing, amazing. So that's that's what I've been watching. That's our, that's our something old. God knows what the next two weeks will bring. Once I pass these off, I've got ideas, yes. including Deaf Crocodile releases, as somebody might have just turned me on to, but we'll see how that one goes. Yes. I'm sorry, uh, but they are quite amazing. You know, you're going to talk about what you're passionate about. This is the whole point. And if anybody's and, still listening, like in the Dear God, that's the whole point. Yeah, and obviously, just to perhaps annoy you, I did get the Walter Hill box set um, because I only had hard times on Eureka. So I didn't have the rest of them, and the driver 4K looks really nice. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure it's similar to the 4K that Studio Canal was. It Studio Canal really? Yes, it was. I bought that. Um, yeah. And I did. I haven't watched all of them, but I watched Johnny Handsome, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Morgan Freeman is another early career um, bad man. Yeah, um, and a typical style. So I, I was definitely justified. I remember a man telling me he was done with imprint. Thank God, I've managed to break the imprint yeah. bug. It's gone. Yeah, it's a thing of the past. Imports from Australia is something I'm no longer part of yet. Yeah, it's just the right release that is what's needed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it was it was cheaper. Obviously, if you try and get it on eBay, it's like two hundred and fifty yeah. quid. So it was cheaper than that. I'll assure you. So. The the easiest the easiest thing for me to do is skip actually a box set like that because a lot of those films have been available or are available in other yeah. in other forms. It's the film you know that the um, the film collections of the actors that they're doing. I look at those and go, those aren't getting releases anywhere else. These this might be the only opportunity to get those couple of films by Gene Hackman, those couple of films by Jennifer yeah. Connelly, by Jennifer yeah, Connelly. <laughs> I may be talking to seven of us. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Mm. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Lots who's of different reasons. Who's the third? Jessica one? Lang was it or Jessica Je- Lang? Is it Jessica Lang? I think it might be. I'm um, not sure. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Who who knows? Which but does bring us on yes. to in terms of pickups or something new section, which is you know any news, kind of upcoming releases, anything you picked up recently that you think I haven't really got digging into, and obviously you've talked about Walter Hill there being a very prominent release that is now gone. There's no point talking about it because you can't buy it anymore unless you decide to sell your yeah. copy. There's uh, fantastic extras. Walter Hill, who fortunately is still with us, so he's done extensive interviews on in all the films. So Excellent. Which is fascinating. Well, one of the nice things I think about it is Walter Hill having a catalogue as he does, there's ones that aren't even on that box set that you can pick up and, and look at like the Geronimo's yeah. out on the uh, indicator. And I don't think Trespass is on that either, is it? No, that's 101 films. It's 101 on date. You can get. I might say you might want to skip it, but if you're a completionist, you know, that's, that's yeah. fine. Because I was actually thinking, where where does Walter Hill actually sit? Because he's not necessarily 
an auteur. He's not necessarily a great filmmaker, but there's something kind of truthful about his films. There's an honesty about his films. The thing that strikes me so I'm not is actually when, sure. when it was really no, it was announced. Remember, Imprint announced it months ahead of it. There was such a stir of going, "Oh my God, yeah. Walter Hill box set." To the point that there are way more prominent filmmakers that if they were in the box set, there wouldn't have been as much excitement about, which yeah. kind of does make you think about, oh, maybe I need to do a bit of a reevaluation because obviously Walter Hill has some very prominent and famous movies yeah. that everybody loves, uh, but it's, it's overall catalogue. I'm not so sure I could go every film's a winner. They're all entertaining. Like even Trespass is entertaining. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you forget he also did the 40 Hours films, which yeah, that's right. I don't yeah. actually have. And I'm not that big a fan of. It's, it is weird because obviously Streets and Fire, mm-hmm. which I know is one of Nazrin Prod's favourites, but that is interesting because yeah. you could, I can, I can say, you know, for me, he's never made a masterpiece or anything, but I do like a lot of his films. So, yeah, yeah. Tis what true. is he? <laughs> Nobody what is he? Who, who is his, who are his contemporaries? Who are the people that are like him? Because he would sort of get lumped with a, like a lesser Michael Mann or something for me in some ways, you know. Yeah, be like John Millius or mm. even I guess John Carpenter, I guess in some way, yeah, round about that same kind it's a bit of more time. mainstream than Carpenter, but kind of yeah, yeah. entertaining films. We had films that were were people were supposed to enjoy at the cinema, for instance. Yeah. I mean, he said. Often, pretty much all of his films are westerns because he just loved westerns, um, which is what John Carpenter says, pretty much. Yeah, I suppose that's um, true. You're going to get hate mail. That's good. I'm glad you said that. Not yeah, me. That's, that's good. Right. So, other things that are to. making the news in terms of uh, in terms of the Criterion UK might be making a comeback. Yeah, I saw that. So after ours has been classified by release by Spirit Entertainment as the distribution house. Uh, and the reason I have it here to talk about is, he bothered? Um, not the way that current criterion is going, because um, I find myself, when the monthly announcements get made, criterion is probably the one that I look at last, even if I look at it. I usually see people's videos, which usually have the thumbnail of what they're releasing. Yes. <laughs> um, and if compared with Indicator who I just get anyway. Um, and obviously now Radiance. Yeah, I'm not really that excited about Criterion, especially when they seem obsessed. Nothing against Terry Gilliam, but they're obsessed about getting all of Gilliam's films in 4K. I didn't realise there was this huge fan club of Gilliam demanding all of his films in 4K, even if there is a lenticular cover on Time Bandits. I'm interested to see it's weird. Time Bandits. Time Bandits is not a film that screams 4K to me. I have to say, I like, I really like. No, it. I don't I even have re- it. So it's, oh, do you know? Yeah. I mean, I really like Time Bandits. It's it's kind of like it's the type of movie I think you watch as an adult. Going, God, I would love that as a kid. But if you had seen it as a kid, you'd have hated it, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do like it, but 4K? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, and it's maybe just because I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but kind of putting in films that are less than two years old and three years old just seems I don't mind about it, I have to say. But, I, I have to say, I, Criterion still ex, it excites me, but I would say that for the Criterion UK we're pumping out, and especially with the I would say enormous price increase that they, that they did, they didn't just jump it out up by... Yeah. a pound or two they jumped it up by you know nearly 50 yeah. percent yeah it was nearly 50 yeah. percent jump of it and for those same films to just not be 4k which i mean i understand the reasons for it not being 4k but the cost prohibitive and at, a, at that point you may as well import it from from the u.s yeah but plus they don't seem to be doing that much work with new extras but they're not they're not doing anything they're pretty with the much extras. porting you know, they did Tales of Hoffman from DVD to Blu-ray That's and right. pretty much added nothing. Um, and the Studio Canal is far superior, I think. Yeah. Um, and I do feel that Criterion just thinks it's the name and they can release we'll anything they want. Yeah. Um, obviously, they can release anything they want, but sometimes I think it is name recognition. But I do have a hope that they come back, they start doing 4K, be a big, you know, if they start doing 4K, I'll support it. 
uh, well, for the films that I haven't already gotten Blu-ray, where they're not just adding a 4K yeah. disc, uh, I, I hope they sort of up the release slate because I think this for any of us that have been collecting Criterion for a while, like I'm sure they're the same. When their releases get posted and they're going back in the catalog, I usually have a couple of them already for one reason. Now that I'm, yeah. I'm definitely the exception rather than the rule, but Criterion are a niche label anyway and if your niche has already got those films somewhere else like you're sort of in a weird yeah, spot and it's stuff like Johnny Toe's Throwdown yes. that Eureka released like six months earlier and a really and good Criterion version Criterion release it and they're expecting I mean unless they think there's people that only collect Criterions and they don't collect any other booty label but I know I can't accuse anybody of double dipping because I've doubled it quite a lot um, once I settle down again, I'll probably do a video on the titles that I've double dipped yeah. and the reasons. I can explain them all. Um, but kind sure of releasing a thing. film, well, yeah. <laughs> um, but kind of releasing one that's just had a boutique label release like within I, months. It's I don't think I don't think I have a massive problem with that because at least it's for another territory. In fact, I really really like the current trend of. A company sees that a release has been made, say in America, and they know people will yeah. import it, and they'll come out very quickly and say, "By the way, idiot, I've done this." For instance, uh, we've got a version of that coming. I seen today yeah. Second Sight had put out that Possession's coming in a special 4K special edition to see if people having the import the one from Umbrella yeah. that's been announced, uh, and I think Severn and stuff have done very similar things. I really like this trend of of people saying, "Look, that's there." If you're patient and you want to support us, look, certainly go ahead and pre-order that if you want, but we have one coming and we'll sing. It was the same with uh, Targets, would, yeah. would have been the other one that was cancelled by BFI, and I remember like, B- BFI's Facebook group and Ben, etc., that, that, that's on there, very good about going, like, I think we'll do a better job of the release of Targets for that, rather than you paying 30-odd pounds yeah. to import that, you know, so be patient, it'll come, which would be nice. I suppose if you put it like that, I guess that's... Let's see. A good and, argument. Like you were saying about Double Dip, they're not the only company that do it. Like, Touch of Evil is coming. No. From Eureka? Yeah. Because, as I said um, before we came on the show, um, mm. that I was so tempted to spend 50 quid on the Kino Lorber and Touch of Evil 4K. And, of course, Eureka um, has is going to release it in September with lovely artwork and a lovely cardboard box. So yeah, I'm glad I didn't. Some would say, controversially, look, you send lovely artwork because a lot of people like the original post art that's on the Kino, which, to be honest, if, if yeah. that's your determining factor, then, again, that's a very easy choice for you to make. Just import yeah. the Kino. Like, it's fine. I, I happen to really like the, the Touch of Eagle 4K, and yeah. let's be honest, the cardboard's thicker. It is. It will last longer if you continually rub it. Thick cardboard. Some collectors do. So. Big, you know, that's a big difference maker for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We shall see. I did import the 4K of After Hours, I have to say. Um, and I'll probably do that with One False Move as well, but they are quite expensive. But you already have a copy of One False Move, then? One False Move, yeah, and an an Yeah. Yeah, but this is a 4K <laughs> from Criterion. And I like to support. Carl Franklin's work. Well, that's fair. That's pretty fair. much five years ago, Devil in a Blue Dress, which is one of the greatest American films of the 90s, One False mm-hmm. Move, which is arguably one of the best films of the 90s, completely forgotten about. <laughs> um, and then now, everybody loves them. So, yeah. um, well, as I said, that's what we the videos that I've made with, yeah, those videos that I made, these DVDs should get a Blu-ray. It's remarkable going back and seeing how in these kind of four or five years quite a lot of them have yeah and one other thing i wanted to talk about and that is these cursing box sets that they're doing the director box sets yeah i think i see is that decalogue behind your head or uh, not decalogue, yes, sorry three colors three colors yeah behind your head uh it's obviously a lovely set um that came out etc and we have the robin Ostland was out today or it's out next week one of those two anyway 
Yeah, uh, Avengers, Avengers has already been out. And been that is slowly coming down in price, which is good. At a certain point, I will jump on that because yes, yeah, so all that problem. I think it's down Avengers... to one seven five. Yes, one seven five. I was I watched Red Sun and seen the documentary, and Vendors obviously features very prominently in a lot of that discussion. And yeah. I was like, God, there's a director that I really need to see more of, the, especially the earlier kind of films that are there. Uh, and they've just announced, I mean, Lars von Trier. I can't say is somebody that a lot of people will jump and say, oh, just like Vin Vendors, is but more of a challenging filmmaker. But they've done a big box set of his and. At the same time, announced breaking the waves in 4K, but 4K disc isn't in the box set. As far as I know, anyway, maybe the details will come out and I may not well, have to do it myself. Did they not do that Wings of Desire? Is Wings of Desire well, 4K not in the vendors? Set? So the 4K was so a criterion. It was a yeah. 4K of criterion so Wings of Desire. Curzon, I, think, no. I think Curzon, owned, they did release a lot of those films as individual Blu-rays, so I'll ask for they're all they're all on Blu-ray because I've been in HMB, but I don't think it was 4K. But it, it would be the right. same problem if it is. That seems sort of problematic to me because look, I like the common theme of them. The kind of the kind of like textured outer that they're doing in these different colors. I think you know you could argue yeah. whether they're overpriced. Of course, they're overpriced. Everything's overpriced. Yeah. But if you like Von Trier as a filmmaker, you know it'd be a really nice place to go. But you're then gonna have to go and get. 4K release of, of that as well. I mean, I suppose if you're not that bothered about 4K, um, I guess. But well, this is why I want. I mean, to I've, I only have seen Melancholia, so mm-hmm. you could argue that's a perfect opportunity so once it comes in place pound. just to it's get release. it all in the one place. Yeah, and not that different from say, you know. The Pasolini box set from Criterion or the Varda yeah. box set or anything like that. But as somebody that's recently 4K, as you are, and and yeah. as you want to do, dove in with both hands, both feet going, didn't, didn't trickle in. I've behaved myself. Started yeah. doing haul videos and all sorts of other behavior. Do, <laughs> I'll have to do an updated 4K video at some point in the <laughs> future when I. Is come 4K back and... all that? problem because i actually seen a comment i think it was on blu-ray.com somebody said i'm future proofing my collection with 4k and i thought i know what you're saying that's a weird statement because blu-ray is a hell of a quality of format that yeah. never did um, i personally some of them you can see the difference mm-hmm. but a lot of them it's slight so i wouldn't sit and redo my entire collection in 4k even if i could yeah like let's be clear i'm not totally sitting in judgment here because like i'm bloody guilty as an x-man of of having multiple yeah. copies and upgrading and looking for whatever although i do kind of find myself for studio releases thinking it'll be on a two for 24 or a two for 25 or two for 30 at some yeah. stage because it's studio release whereas some of the other like arrow releases etc not as likely to happen, for instance, you know, yeah. uh, and I can make, pick and choose my ones. Like Weird Science is coming out in four K. Do I like Weird Science? Yes, I do. Actually, quite a bit. I've got a Blu Ray with a slipcover. Do I need a four K? It's a really nice slipcover. It is a very nice slipcover, but I've already got it. I do need yeah. to pay it for the end it. No, I don't. Well, certainly not at the moment. And I, I reserve yeah. the right to change my mind mind at a moment's notice on one kind of madness when I see it appear in somebody's video and I kind of go, but it is nice. And if they say that the upgrade in pictures yeah. is that much better, then uh, I do love that movie. You know, you get the idea. So, I mean, I think a lot of it goes to directors as well. So every 4K that comes out of Cronenberg, I'm going to get that. Yes. It's that simple. Um, whereas there's other things that I can kind of, or as you say, wait until it goes into a deal or goes cheaper. So there's no great Indeed. rush. Um, to get it basically. Yeah. So I just thought I'd go through the upcoming releases for the next two weeks. Not all of them, but the kind of prominent ones. See if there's any interest. Kind of yes, no, anything you pre-ordered or otherwise. Uh, Studio Canal Vintage Classics, the Muriel Box films that everybody assumed was going to come into the box set. So Passion of Stranger, Truth About Women, Rattle of a Civil Man. I've seen none of them. I've seen trailers for them all now. Sort of interest me, I would say. I haven't seen any information about it, but yeah. Studio Canal's vintage is a treasure trove. Yeah. One of the more underappreciated 
uh, yeah, things absolutely. that was something I'll always have interest in because they're always entertaining uh, yeah. in some way and, and occasionally have pretty not massive sales but you can usually what is the current release price of 15 brand new will go down to 10 or 12 pretty quickly so if you yeah. want to wait and you're patient then you can pick up a pretty nice box set of single releases of those uh, Warner Brother Archive you got any of the since they've been releasing in the UK um I did get one and I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um I did get one. I didn't get the Barbara Stanwyck, but I will mm. at some point. Yep. Because I have grown to appreciate Barbara Stanwyck in the last <laughs> few years. Yep. Um what was it? That's terrible. I can't even remember. It what was the be, one that must... came out at the same time as Barbara Stanwyck? It was two. Naked Spur. <laughs> Naked, oh yes, yes, the Naked Spur, Anthony Mann, indeed, Naked which, Spur, I, yeah. which I've talked about actually. Well, they are releasing Night at the Opera, which is from the Marx Brothers, so they've gone through those. I'm a bit in two minds whether I need more Marx Brothers in my collection. I kind of, hmm, I'll see. And then Rachel, Rachel, which is Joanne Woodward, uh, which I haven't seen. Yeah, either. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. But uh, I think those those Warner Brother, they're very simple. They're pretty much just the film and a trailer. Some of them have yeah. an extra. Some of them have a couple Warner Brothers cartoon, which is kind of cute. But they're also not yes. super expensive. Uh, and then the big 4K release for the month is Roman Holiday. I've never seen it. Me neither. My wife's seen mm. it. I, I've, it's terrible because I've walked in it and my wife's been in the middle of watching it. And I am not the type of person that can walk in the middle of a movie and go, oh, I'll pick this up the rest of the way. I'll be like, I'll watch yeah. that again by myself at some stage. So that was the big 4K release I haven't seen. I Again, studio film said the scoop print I've no doubt that it will be then I'll probably pick it up in the studio day yeah. further down the line uh, the following week idiot films you don't seem to collect an awful lot of idiot and they're kung fu you're not seem to be a kung fu person maybe some no. of the targets um, obviously I've got both Shaw Brothers um, mm. in a jar at home no both Shaw <laughs> Brothers box sets um, yeah it's something I might get to later but I, don't well, really feel I didn't mention this. Him. I watched Shal and Mantis from Idiot, which is another Shaw Brothers one. Really good. Really good. Yeah, I mean... Shaw Brothers I didn't do bad, bad ones, so. Yeah. No. It yeah. didn't, didn't happen. Didn't happen. And then we and both they have... they do have nice slip covers. They did. They, they are very nice. I like the artwork that goes on a lot of those. Uh, the Radiance releases are both coming our way. Moment of Romance and Commedia Italiana with Il Sorpasso. Is that not? Yeah, looking forward to seeing that because I've never actually seen you so yeah. well, so. And and of course, don't forget your copy of Dirty Artists Volume Two magazine. Yes. Have you read they the first one? Send it to you. Yeah, that is. It's coming. Well, it's part of the order now because you have to pay for it if you're not. Yeah, I have skimmed ordered. the first one. So you've done better than I have. Uh, Eureka have uh, <laughs> three ages by Buster Keaton. And the Sky yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. I'll do three ages of. Have my, I've seen Saphead, that's the only one I don't own. Um, but I quite like Saphead, yeah, I need so to pick that one up as well. I'll, uh, I'll pick that up. Uh, talk about Arrow Weird Science 4K, they've got like, Last House on the left coming in 4K as well. Fine for that. Yeah. BFI have Brannigan with our best friend on it. Yeah, I'll probably leave that one to shock nobody. Yeah. But... Uh, Blazing Magnum is out in Studio Canal Club Classics, and then the 4K releases are Bloodsport and. Mad Max. I thought Mad Max was out already, but I must have missed that in some way. Yeah, it's certainly out in Steelbook 4K, yeah. but maybe that's a set. I, oh, yes, it was out in the set, so it might yeah, be coming that's out a Steelbook in, set. Yeah. in the original. So, like, the next two weeks for me, aside from the Three Ages, and maybe some of those um, vintage classics, but I'm usually quite patient about those, are pretty clear yeah. for me. It's the week uh, weeks afterwards when we start getting into those uh, second sight releases of Crimes of the Future and It Follows. Yeah, I've pre-ordered Crimes of the Future even though I've already got it in 4K. Um, I've left It Follows. Ooh. I didn't want to... I've never actually seen it and I thought I would leave it for a but, big special box. But you, but you might miss out on it. Are you willing to take I know, that chance? I'm thinking that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice image in the front. <laughs> I might, I might try and behave myself, and uh, that's going to sell out quite quickly, isn't it? I think That'll sell so. out quicker than well, Crimes of the Future. This was the thing with uh, Picnic and Hanging Rock. I didn't get. That's one of. This is the only second sight one I've got because I've got the Criterion one with the book. I do feel yeah. having two versions of Picnic and Hanging Rock with books is 
It's not the di- it's not having the two discs. It's the problem. I could just buy the disc by itself, yeah. but then it feels like I'm cheating myself out. What is wrong with me? It's absolutely dreadful. I did pick up May and Frontiers. Yes, so in the right. second sight. I've watched them, of course. Yeah, yeah May is a lovely little film. Ah, it looks it from the cover. Yeah, it's a lovely little film. <laughs> Uh, yes, indeed. So that's that's what's coming out in the next couple of weeks, and uh, th- thankfully I'm kind of hiding, doing the ostrich thing of sticking my head in the sand a little bit and saying nothing's being released. Yeah, because neither the end of August the Zalaski mm-hmm. box that's right. set from Eureka is coming out, which was delayed. So I think a lot of people were quite relieved it was delayed, so they could save their money for a little bit longer. Well, um, but I'm definitely gonna pick that one up. So. If, if it helps, there are some early reports that it's very, very good. And obviously Radiance released in November the Polish science fiction That's shop, right. which is just Shulkin. Yeah, yeah. looks absolutely awesome. And, because bizarrely um, the week before I was looking, because I'd read about, I'll get the name wrong, but the, the B.O.D.O. film or whatever it is. And on eBay, it was like 60 quid for a DVD. Right. And of course, it's in the Radiance set. So, Close Radiance shave. are doing a really good job. So. Yeah, I, I, I do employ you if you're interested in Radiance. There's obviously the stream on Sunday. Uh, we'll get into it. Uh, but suffice to say, yeah. on my point of view, I think Radiance are exactly the label that I wanted them to be when they kind of came Yeah, I mean, scene. they're releasing another fil- a film from the director of and filler up super, mm-hmm. which I will get. Valiant. despite filler up super, because um, that's got Jean Louis Tien Yong in it. So. That's right. They always great, Jean Louis. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I suppose this is an easy question to answer, but I, I'm interested to see if anybody has any different opinions of it. If you had to compare Radiance to be most like another label, who is that label? Well, obviously, it's a bit of Rero, which they are now partnering with, yeah, yeah. and looking forward to their first release. Um, because they do, for boutique collectors, the traditional Japanese, yes, let's say, yes. um, they do some experimental stuff. They're breaking into the Italian which is a rich vein mm, oh, yes. outside of the big four or the oh. big three, however you want to call it, because that's kind of my Italian. Yeah. is not necessarily the big three or the big four. Um, yeah, it's hard. I think they're... And, of course, they do have Miami Blues, the hot spot, right. so they're still, right. they still have a dip in their toe in that. I mean, I suppose... Our dream scenario of Arrow, but it's not really Arrow because it doesn't have that slasher aesthetic. So yeah, it's it, it's tough. Like I definitely think, I think they so. they are very much for yeah. me what Arrow Academy promised to be before they kind of got their yeah. their tails clipped or whatever. With but with some yeah. of that other genre stuff and those American titles, which unfortunately still seem to be their highest selling titles all the time. You know, the Welcome to the Dollhouse, yeah. I think, was their fastest selling title that there was in Miami Blues, yeah. etc. It was the same. So, um, it was interesting. But again, I, if, it's in, and obviously if they go down that German route as well, mm-hmm. away from the big three in Germany. If you include, if you include Vendor, Italy, then Vendor's the Herzog, yeah. Fassbender. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, which again is more um, interesting and more kind of. I think even though if Carson released a complete works of Herzog, I know there are already some box sets of Herzog. Mm-hmm. But, well, to um, be fair, the BFI set is pretty, pretty big. I mean, not comprehensive yeah, as in the word you would use for it, but yeah. it's you could make a start on that on that box set and still be going sometime Absolutely. later. Let's let's be saying so. So that's those. Yeah. Yeah, ratings are. I mean, it's hard to believe it's only been not even a year, but yeah, it's only eight months. Um, they are, yeah, they are um, doing impressive work. Yeah, I'm a big fan. So that's it. On to something borrowed. We're on to also on D. You may be the only other person that I knew I could get on and be comfortable that would at least make an attempt to, to put on a French accent. 
Yes, um, on Sunday or in Sandy's, if you want to, <laughs> you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, I ha- hadn't heard. I think I'd heard it was good. Um, or very good, but I hadn't really heard the details of it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it kind of starts very trance-like, yeah. and even the first kind of camera moves are very. Um, what's the word? I'm not going to use hypnotic, but very kind of slow and measured. The film itself is kind of a slow burn. Um, I know people have criticised it for feeling manipulated and things like that. That's but it. I'm just going to say, I think if play. you if you go along with it and try not to jump steps ahead and just flow with it, I think it's a really rewarding film obviously yeah. we're not going to go into spoilers um but as a film about war the effects of war the effects of war on families um i think it's absolutely um wonderful and i think deserves its reputation and when people you know he says it's Villeneuve's best film they're kind of some people are a bit thrown by it because yeah. it's not in English. Um, well, I'll step back a little bit and actually give you some of the stats for it because I'll give you the MDB rating as 8.3. It's comfortably yeah. the Villeneuve's highest rated film in MDB. If you can go by the Metascore, the Metascore and Metacritic is 80 with an 8.1 user score, 91% in Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and it grossed at the time 17 million just in terms of, of dollars worldwide. Yeah. Was nominated for the 2011 uh, Best Art and National Picture, which is a bit of a strange category because countries nominate their representation, if you know what I mean. It's not picked from a yeah. hat. And obviously, it was representing Canada. And there's yeah. not very much Canadian about the film, as, as, as no. you kind of allude to. But that it didn't win. It won the, In a Better World from Denmark won that year. And I'll give you some... I actually had... Uh, a look at what else was nominated by the other countries that year. So, Of Gods and Men was uh, nominated from France. Uh, Beautiful with uh, Javier Bardem, I think that's his, his movie, isn't Beautiful? Is in that Dog Tooth by your good friend from Greece, Douglas Lanthimos, yep. and uh, Uncle Pumi, who can recall his past lives by a pitch of pong, where is school or whatever. Uh, yeah. I think that's probably his name, and if not, yes, you can correct yes. me. <laughs> certainly one of them. Yeah. But like a lot of very good films that year, yeah. And I sort of feel like because we obviously are both fans of Polytechnic, which he'd done, which was his film before yeah. that, you know, Villeneuve. And as you say, this was his last non-English language film before he went and did Prisoners, uh, or Enemy after that, and it's become this much lauded storyteller. I don't think there's a better example of how to craft a really complex sort of story that's multi-layered, multi-country, all those things. Even the idea that you have twins at the start adds another level of difficulty into the story. Yeah, plus the fact that he drifts between past and present Present. without going 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. two years ago. You know, he actually... if he did on Sondi after Prisoners in Hollywood, mm-hmm. would that change? And it would be 10 years ago, two years ago, would come up on the screen. Whereas this very much like John Sayles' Lone Star, which I'll crowbar John Sayles in, <laughs> where he just cuts between past and present just by moving a camera along a floor and then we're yep. back. Um, just subtle camera moves and you just turn around and then you're in the past. So there's no, we are now going, this is now a flashback, this is now, yeah. because they're both linked. The past and present are linked closer than what we actually realise. I, I think that's one of the really interesting things, because as you say, I think Hollywood have a tendency to, to kind of lead you by the nose a bit more and say this is where this is happening. But I think those moments where you're not sure what time period you're in, or who the characters are at this stage, because obviously even the central character of the mother... Um, her hairstyle changes even throughout yeah. the course of the film and we're not always sure when we get brought into your company which stage of our life we're at or where it fits yeah. but that feeling of unsettledness I think I think it aids the twins story if you know what I mean because they're trying yeah. to find out about the time they're not sure how they feel about it how how 
you know, and, and it translates to the viewer so well. I think that all works so well, that kind of feeling of, oh, I'm not sure what's going on all the time. Yeah, and when, because the film does lull you in, it does kind of have a kind of heartbeat that's always ebbing and flowing. So you do get pulled in if you're not being one of those viewers to go, oh, I'm going to guess what's going on. Um, so when certain things happen, it is like being hit in the face with a wet fish. Mm. And I think that works really well. And again, the score isn't your dramatic, melodramatic score. It just kind of drifts along. And again, it just lulls you into this sense of, as you say, you're not quite sure what's going on. And then it hits you in the face. So I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here and say I could accuse the film of being over manipulative and over melodramatic so that the events of the film uh, the film kind of have more impact um fur well i mean that is one of the criticisms of it i've seen in kind of not negative reviews but kind of three star reviews yeah um as people feel manipulated by it um i mean i didn't personally because i was just hooked in to those two people trying mm-hmm. to find out about their family um, and at one point I was kind of you know when it gets near the end it was like what's she on about what's she on? and then it finally the penny finally dropped mm-hmm. so I didn't feel it was kind of obvious or maybe I was just a bit slow um, which is quite possible so I didn't personally feel it was kind of manipulative but I can see why people um, would think that like Obviously, I'm somebody that loves melodrama, so I obviously didn't think it at all. But yeah. I can, I can, I'm often blind to that in films that a lot of people will often say, "God, how could, how could you get over how saccharine that scene was, or whatever?" Yeah. And I just live for the payoff of it. So in the case of this, obviously, there's revel, there's massive revelations yeah. in the film, but also that scene where the trying to give spoilers right but 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 the, the in the single room where the, the, the conversation is happening let's just say yeah. that is one of those scenes where you're afraid to breathe because you're if any of us put you in the room because of yeah. how it is etc and you're afraid that if you breathe too loudly it'll break the tension of, of the scene but that's such yeah. masterful filmmaking to be able to do that and i think if you have to manipulate people for that to achieve that end then i think I mean, at the end of the day, all filmmakers manipulate the audience because that's, that's their job to basically tell the story that they're telling. Um, you know, every shot, well, I was going to say every shot is calculated, but obviously some directors, that's not trick the case. Um, so that's kind of part of their job to get an audience reaction. Now, obviously some directors use soaring music or dramatic mm-hmm. music and, you know, certain camera moves to accentuate that. Um, but again, if you go into it cynically going, oh, I'm, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and I'm going to try and figure it out rather than just experiencing it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people nowadays, and we might be guilty of it as well because we've seen so many films, you kind of get jaded. So if there's certain setups you can kind of say, oh, well, that's going to happen, this is going to end like that, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I do think if you just experience it, and I think you're hooked into the characters, even though, as you say, you might not know exactly what's going on. But to me, I found it riveting to find oh. out what goes on when the penny drops and my penny dropped. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it is one of those kind of... <sighs> Head, 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 head blowing when you get the payoff of what everything that's been happening and you know excuse the pun but you've been kept in the dark uh, for some yeah. of it and it, it kind of gets uh, and it's a, it's a revelation to everybody it's not just a revelation to us it's a revelation to everybody that's involved in the screen it, it's such a massive movie I think it was a you know, friend and commenter on both our channels Ben Van Ass, his, uh it was one of his recommendations for a film for people yeah. to watch as the next step and I, and I think it's yeah. it's an absolutely brilliant film for exactly it's, that. It's one of the handful of films that after I finished watching it, I was just sitting there going, wow. Yeah. 
you know, it's not amazing visually, you know, it's not beautifully composed, obviously it's Villeneuve's that is shot nicely, but it's, we're not talking about amazing compositions, mm-hmm. you know, um, but emotionally it was just one of those wows after you've watched it. I, I sort of think it's the kind of movie that if somebody sees it and then sits in it and somebody asks them in short period after, what's the greatest film of all time? I think it's sort of, it can be an acceptable answer for that because it is an incredibly powerful movie um, yeah. in that way, you know, and it's something somebody will be deeply affected by the whole thing. Um, yeah. And the storytelling that goes on. Interestingly, you mentioned about the music because it's, it's something that really stuck at to me when I rewatched it. And that's the fact, and I totally blanked this out, Radiohead play have quite a prominent part in the soundtrack for which given yeah. the kind of place of the world, etc., that it's telling about seems on one hand, you know, strange, but it's only because I recognise it's really here. It's not that it doesn't fit yeah. the, 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 the work. Yeah, the opening scene is very kind of disorientating. Yeah. Because you're radiohead playing and again you're not quite sure what's going on and it's haircuts and it's like it's a full metal jacket or something. But. Yeah, but it gives you that kind of time out of place, which kind of brings me to the idea that, obviously, unless I don't know some of it, this isn't Vinlove's background. He doesn't have any... Like, it's a very political film. Yeah, it was based on a play, which yeah. seems bizarre that this would be... And was it not a one-man play? Or was that, did I just dream that? It wasn't like a huge cast in the play. Um, and it was a guy from that area of the world. Um, even though it's not really specific mm-hmm. what the area is in the film. But it was actually from a play, and it's quite hard to imagine that, that on a stage. But well, It's funny because it, it reminds me a lot of The Kite Runner, um, which is a book, but I've seen it as a, as a, as a play, um, and for its kind of emotional value. But like I did see that as a very small kind of cast mm-hmm. thing and being as powerful. So it's interesting that you say that because that's the, that's the story in terms of location and emotional impact that, that, that it both it reminds me most of but if everybody yeah. has a chance to go see the Kite Runner as a, as a play you should because it'll be another one you'll not you'll let it breathe for about 20 minutes in the middle of it yeah. probably so you can kind of see the emotional impact but such a fine fine choice yeah it's just interesting what he would have done if he hadn't went to um, Hollywood because um, I mean I know people, you know, don't really, there are critics of him, but I do think he does actually ask the audience to pay attention. Oh, yeah. Which not necessarily all Hollywood directors do. And his films aren't cut, 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 cut. Um, He does let you sit with what's happening. He does let you figure stuff out. Um, So I do, I mean... Obviously, you could be cynical and say, well, there's not much competition in Hollywood for the best Hollywood mainstream director. Um, But I just think he is um, very good, but I don't think he's obviously better than Sondi. It it is interesting because what you say about him being, you know, great modern Hollywood, I think to be able to tell the stories and tell the kind of films that he does, you have to earn it. You know, people don't give you money in Hollywood unless you show that you know what you're doing. And he does tend to tell very complex style stories, sort of reminiscent of like a Ridley Scott from very much early in his career and the idea that, okay, I'm going to have to build this world for the yeah. for the audience to understand and exist. In. And, and even in On Sondi, like I say, it's not his ethnicity, it's not his thing, and it's, it's not actually determined where it's set, you know, in terms of the world. It's very, yeah. you know non-script that way so between that and like arrival and uh, uh, even prisoner and stuff he builds the world and that location for the for the viewer or the watcher to exist in so that they feel like this is their town well, this is their place even even enemy which is a very small film mm-hmm. he still creates that world and it is a slightly strange offbeat world and the daylight is always a certain color and it's just slightly, it's reality, but it's not really reality. Mm-hmm. Um, so even in a small film like that, which I don't know, does it have more than five cast members in it? I'm not <laughs> sure. I haven't seen it for a while. Um, but even then, he manages to create a world. 
Yeah, and of course she's got June Part Two coming out. Yeah, with Christopher Walken, which will elevate it, obviously. Absolutely, um, not, not the top five film of all time before you've even seen it. You know, it's just of that level. Yeah, the first part was a bit strange. It was a bit sterile. I felt it was a bit odd. It was good, but it was just a little sterile and. It's, I, I think it's difficult because I had watched, obviously, the Lynch version, which is a very, very different telling of the story, as, yeah. as you probably know. But it has a sort of heart to it that that Villeneuve's doesn't, you know. But that yeah. one has all the budget, one has no budget, one, you know, that's very, things yeah. have moved on, changed a lot. So it's very different to compare, right? It's kind of like the idea that there's both because we kind of see. Yeah. Two very visionary and single-minded storytellers kind of approach the source material. Well, obviously, Umbrella releasing a special deluxe right. edition of the TV miniseries, which has got books and 28 discs and Indeed. fairly spectacular for all you June completists. Yeah, so that's very good and very interesting. And that is On Sunday. The only other thing I want to mention about On Sunday that springs to mind is obviously it has no UK release. As far as I can see, one I mean, one used to have a standard. I, I don't think it does, unless copy. it's out of print. One hundred one hold the yeah, film right state here at the moment, right. uh, which I didn't realize until I went to rent it. I had to rent to, to kind of to watch it, and mm. obviously the one hundred one films logo flashes up very clear at the top. They're obviously sitting on it. Um, they obviously have something planned for it because. Well, obviously the release following, which is coming out, the and Nolan, Memento. and then they're charging a forty quid for a Memento steelbook, which I'll be missing. Um, so you never know; you might be going in a, a Villeneuve run. Well, good friend of the channel Elliot Cohen had said with June two due out at the end of the year, and the fact that these two Nolan releases have coincided with Oppenheimer, uh, no coincidence, maybe. I think we might be primed for and also on the Black Label release around November, December of the year. If they could release these early couple of French ones, Maelstrom, and I can't remember what the other one's called, that would be quite interesting. Because obviously yeah. they're doing Following, which is um, Nolan's first. So. Which is Nolan's best film, indeed. I hear what you're saying there. Um, I haven't actually seen it, so I'm looking not... forward to it. I have actually pre-ordered it. I know. It's on YouTube. Um, and, and, and better than that, yeah, but that's not physical. All the Criterion extras are on YouTube as well. Um, might have to cut that out. Oh well, you know yeah. what can you do? Um, so I, I very much look to somebody, not only just releasing something like this, but it'll give the film a new lease of life in terms of discovery for other yeah. people. People will watch that and go, "Oh my god, why did nobody tell me about this film beforehand?" And then somebody yes. might say, "Do you know what? I heard about it in something blue." Those two. Fools. You never know. You never know. <laughs> they might might not. Uh, like I say, Elliot mentioned it a couple of years ago. I think in a video, and I think that's where I first came on my radar. I have to say, has been been a thing even before. Yeah. I'd seen prisoners or any of those. Even before I'd seen Arrival, probably. Um, and definitely a worthy shout for something to recommend. Yeah, but I think Ben's right. It's it is, you know, if you're familiar with Will News Hollywood. Then it's not that much of a step. Step, yeah. Obviously, it's subtitled, and, but it has a similar kind of structure. And, and it has drama. It's entertaining. It's all those other yeah. things. It's deeply affecting, all that kind of stuff. So that's the end of our first episode. Uh, all that I've really left to yes. do is tease the next episode and give you, if you want to play along with the something borrowed, you know, the film that has been picked by the next person. Uh, we've obviously picked, you know, something that we think is a, an all-time classic of cinema that is very much underseen. And in similar style, our next guest, who I'm not going to name, because I think that's part of the fun, that's part of the metagame, has decided to pick Dracula Prince of Darkness as the something borrowed, which I, I sort of love because it kind of gives the show the the broad nature of, of our wonderful hobby and yes. uh, how film comes in all shapes and forms and, and can be equally enjoyable. So I invite you to come along and join us for, for that next for that next episode whatever it may be hopefully two weeks yes um, so to be determined indeed so I'm going to go 
peruse the vinegar syndrome site to see how many uh, deaf crocodile titles can fit in the box. Yes. As I said to somebody else, they do need aid because they're deaf crocodiles. So. That is true. That is very true. Very true. So, until next time, my name is Chris Moore. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, catch you next time on something like Kick Out. Bye.